Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know, don't know me, I'm uh, Ed Iacobucci. I'm the dean of the, the law school here. I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2018 Grafstein Lecture in Communications. Uh, to begin, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Uh, today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to the opportunity to work on this land. Uh, my job is to talk a little bit about the lecture and then hand it over to my colleague, Professor Anthony Limblett, who will introduce today's a very distinguished lecturer. Uh, this lecturer was established by Senator Jerry S. Grafstein, who I'm pleased to say is here today. Thank you for being here. He's a member of our, our class of 1958, and he established this lecture uh, to commemorate the 40th anniversary of his graduation from the Faculty of Law and the 10th anniversary of the graduation of his son and daughter-in-law from our faculty. We're thrilled uh, that he's here today and thank him again for his generous sponsorship of this wonderful annual event. Over the years, this lecture has had a number of outstanding speakers, both from practice, uh, people like Justice Roger Hughes, Conrad von Finkenstein, and some from the Academy, including such distinguished speakers as uh, our own Peggy Radin, uh, Joshua Gans, Yochai Benkler, and last year, Professor Tim Wu. Today, we're honored to add to this illustrious list of academics with Professor Edward Felton. I will ask my colleague, uh, Professor, Professor Anthony Niblett, to introduce our guest. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Professor Anthony Niblett. Um, it is my incredible honor to present Ed Felton, who is the uh, Robert E. Kahn Professor of Computer Science and Public Affairs at Princeton University. Um, I will keep my introductory remarks rather short. Uh, I will say this, he is one of the leading experts in privacy, cybersecurity, uh, information technology policy. He is the person that the United States government turns to when they want to prosecute Microsoft. He is the person <laughs> that election authorities turn to when they want to protect democracy and make sure their voting machines are not being hacked into. And he is the person that we turn to today to give you a talk on preparing for the future of AI, preparing for a world of intelligent machines. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Ed Felton. Thanks. Well, it's wonderful to be here um, and to talk about a topic that has uh, absorbed a great deal of my time and interest over the last uh, few years and, and really, I think, going back farther than that. You might have heard that AI these days is kind of a big deal. Uh, you see senior executives in the industry saying things like this. Here's the CEO of Google a couple weeks ago. AI is probably the most important thing humanity has ever worked on. Something more profound than electricity or fire. Okay, so that's a pretty strong statement and I don't know how you would rank AI versus electricity and fire. <laughs> but the point is that if, um, uh, even with the normal uh, industry levels of hyperbole, people are saying things like this. Something important must be going on, and, and indeed I think it is. Now, you can listen to famous smart people like Bill Gates and Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk, and all of these gentlemen have talked about AI as a big deal, but in a different way, as an existential threat to humanity. Um, Elon Musk says, more dangerous than nukes. Uh, and at times, the discussion about AI and where it's going can get pretty dark. Sometimes it feels like the debate is uh, about whether the machines will kill us all or whether instead they'll just take our jobs and then kill us all. <laughs> but I don't want to engage in that kind of talk today, so let's instead switch gears Take a deep breath and look at some puppies for a minute. <laughs> and we'll talk about what I think is a more, um, a more restrained view, but also one that I think um, uh, will come around to a view of AI which does see it as a very important um, step. So I want to talk about how to prepare for the future of artificial intelligence. This is a screenshot of a report that I worked on while I was uh, working in the Obama White House about the future of AI. This was something which uh, looked like a national priority in science and technology policy in the US. Uh, but I want to talk about how to prepare for this. The first step in preparing for the future is to clarify what the future might be. 
Um, and I'll spend most of the time today on that. So in the talk, I'll have five parts. Uh, the first, we'll talk about what AI is and how it got to be the way it is, a little bit of history. Second, I'll talk about this idea of the singularity, which is very popular, you often hear about it, and we'll drill down a little bit into what the singularity is or, or is said to be. Um, then, I'll then I'll assess this uh, singularity theory and look at um, to what extent we should believe it or what version of it we should believe. Uh, I'll then move on and talk about an alternative model to the singularity, which I call the multiplicity. Um, and I'll talk about an alternative view of the AI future that I think is better rooted in the history of AI up to now. And then finally, I'll come around to some policy implications. So let's start with part one, what is AI? Now, every significant uh, public report about AI has to start with a throat-clearing, embarrassing paragraph that says that there's no single widely accepted definition of AI, because there isn't. Uh, there are lots of different definitions floating around, and a pretty good working one is this definition on this slide that comes from John McCarthy, one of the pioneers of the field. That AI is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent software. So that's an excellent definition of the artificial part, but not so much of the intelligence part. Intelligence is just left undefined here. And indeed, the nature of intelligence is a great mystery to us still. So what is intelligence? Well, there are maybe two things we know. One is that whatever it is, we, uh, uh, we believe that people have it. Um, and also, we think at least that uh, with respect to machines and other systems, that we know intelligence when we see it. So I'm not going to define AI for you any more than this, except to say we think we know it when we see it, and we'll talk about what are the attributes of this technology that people call AI. Now, a lot of the excitement in AI nowadays is really around a particular branch of AI research and development, which is machine learning. And the good news is machine learning is a thing that's well-defined and that we can drill down into a little bit. So machine learning is about how to build computer systems that can learn without being explicitly programmed. Rather than giving the machine a set of rules for what to do, we ask it to learn from examples or from data or from experience. And there are three main branches or, or styles of work within machine learning. The first is supervised learning. Uh, in supervised learning, a system is given a set of example inputs. Each input is labeled with what is deemed to be the correct answer for that input. And the machine is asked to infer a rule that will give accurate answers for other input examples that it hasn't seen. So if you want to predict, for example, which email messages are spam, what you're really predicting is which messages will a user say are spam if you show them to the user. That's a predictive task. So you can take lots of examples of email messages that are labeled as spam or not spam and ask the machine to figure out how to tell the difference. The second style of machine learning, the second type of problem, is unsupervised learning. Here the system is given a set of data points and isn't given any notion of a correct answer. And what we ask of the system is that it finds some kind of patterns or structure in the data to find clusters of data points or to find a way of explaining or characterizing these data points in a relatively parsimonious way to sort of reduce the complexity, come up with a simple explanation that can explain most of what we see in this data. And the third kind is reinforcement learning. And here the setup is you imagine that a system has a set of controls. Imagine a bunch of buttons and it can press and knobs it can turn. Um, and it's put in an environment that gives it positive or negative feedback about how well it's doing some task. And then the system is trying to learn how to operate the controls in a way that will get good feedback. So you can imagine, for example, putting a vehicle, uh, a, a machine into control of a vehicle in a simulated environment and having it try the various pedals and knobs and wheels and so on to try to figure out how to get somewhere efficiently without crashing. Now, that's not a thing we would want to do in, the, in a real world with real cars, but in a simulated world we might do that. So these are the thing, kinds of tasks that machine learning aims to do. All right, let me talk a little bit about the history of AI, and I'm going to talk about two major steps that happened early. Uh, machine learning was present really from the very birth of AI. Um, a fair point to put the birth of AI was with the paper in 1943 by McCullough and Pitts. McCullough and Pitts were an electrical engineer and a logician, and what they did essentially was to bring together their two fields in a certain way. 
The key idea in this paper is what's down here, that mathematical structures that are inspired by the brain, not a copy of or emulation of the brain, but just a structure that is brain-like, uh, that these can do complex logical reasoning. And they showed how you could take any computation or logical process that could be expressed in formal logic and build it out of a set of brain-like mathematical structures. Uh, the next major step was, um, uh, was Alan Turing's famous paper from 1950 called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. It had one of the best first sentences of any paper ever. I propose to answer the question, can machines think? Uh, and Turing proposed what he called the imitation game, what we now call the Turing test. But the key ideas in this paper were about how you define intelligence. And Turing's, uh, the key ideas first were that Turing defined intelligence in terms of behavior, not in terms of the internal experience. He didn't ask, is the machine conscious? Or does it have an experience that feels like human thinking? He just asked, are its externally visible behaviors consistent with the idea that it's intelligent? So intelligence is defined by behavior. We don't ask about internal states. We don't require anything about internal states. And second, he said, the more controversial, I think, in the long run statement, that the goal is to behave like a person. OK, we can fast forward through the next 50 years of AI history. It went basically like this. We saw slow but steady progress in the technical challenges of trying to make machines behave more, as, more closer to as if they were intelligent. While there was this slow and steady technical progress, there were these enormous waves of optimism and pessimism, really untethered from the underlying technical level of progress. Um, more like mood swings, both in the research community and also among the public. But at the, by the end of this period, around the year 2000, some very large grand challenges still remained unsolved. Things like task, uh, tasks involving interpreting complex inputs, such as image recognition and speech recognition. Uh, natural language processing tasks, like translating a text from one language to another with fluency or writing a concise summary of a longer document. Playing complex games like Go, a, a, a very complex, perfect information strategic game, and poker, a game involving hidden information and deception. Uh, as well as things like safety critical control tasks like driving a car. Had you asked an AI expert in the year 2000 about these tasks, they would have said, that these are grand challenges. We don't know when they will be solved. We believe they will be solved eventually, but who knows when. Uh, which is why it was somewhat surprising that starting around 2010 or so, there was a big surge of progress in the field of AI, driven by progress in machine learning, um, that led to human level or better than human performance on a number of these grand challenges. And this was driven by three interlocking factors. First. Uh, the availability of new and very large data sets that could be the raw material for AI analysis. Second, better algorithms developed by AI researchers that could m get more out of that data. And then finally, bigger and faster computers on which to run those uh, algorithms and store those, that data set. So these three factors came together. We saw a sudden surge of progress. Some of the grand challenges started to fall. And big tech companies started to invest in a big way in AI, and popular interest in AI grew. Uh, and that pretty much brings us up to today, to the point where CEOs of very large companies are saying, this is bigger than electricity and fire. Now let's look forward. If we look forward and talk about the farther future of AI, one of the big ideas that we hear about is the singularity. And I want to unpack this idea a little bit and talk about precisely what the claim is that singularity theorists are making. Um, and then we'll break it down and talk about uh, how much, to what extent we should believe it. Uh, the singularity argument maybe can be traced back uh, initially to this paper in 1965 by the British American statistician Jack Good, which also had an amazing first sentence. The survival of man depends on the early construction of an ultra-intelligent machine. That's pretty good too. Uh, the core of Good's argument um, was in this passage, which I've broken up into pieces so we can go through it step by step. First, he defines an ultra-intelligent machine as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any person. 
He says, since the design of machines is one of those intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent machine will be able to design even better, even more intelligent machines. This would then lead unquestionably to an intelligence explosion, leaving behind, far behind, the intelligence of people. Therefore, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that we need to ever make, because after that, the machines will invent everything else that needs to be invented. And then there's this little um, caveat at the end, provided that the machine is docile enough to tell us how to keep it under control. Okay, so the core of the argument you can break down into four logical steps, which I'm going to um, uh, describe like this. First, that an ultra-intelligent machine will exist. Second, that each ultra-intelligent machine will design a machine of even greater intelligence. Not just that it will be able to, but that it actually will design that even more intelligent machine. Third, that following from that, that an intelligence explosion will result. And following from that, that the intelligence of people will be left far behind. So that was the initial intelligence explosion argument from Good. The next step in, in building out the singularity theory came with this essay in 1993 by Werner Vinge, a science fiction writer and math professor at San Diego State University. He was apparently the first to refer to Good's intelligence explosion as a singularity. Uh, and this was referring to a term from mathematics. A singularity in math is a point at which a mathematical function starts to behave in an extreme way, uh, as when a function just races off to infinity, for example. So a lot of people think about, so the notion that there would be this sudden transition that happens all at once, um, the singularity, um, uh, really dates to this essay. Many people nowadays talk about the singularity kind of like the event horizon of a black hole. It's a kind of point of no return. Once you cross it, there's no coming back. And you can't really see past it, because whatever lies past that singularity, a world with suddenly super ultra intelligent machines, is so different from the world we live in that we can't really uh, have any hope of predicting or imagining what it will be like. Okay, so if we come back to Good's um, intelligence explosion, um, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. So, right, so here's the, um, in my notes, okay, so here's basically the, uh, uh, the, uh, the steps. Super intelligence leads to intelligence explosion, that causes a singularity, what comes after that? Well, there's a couple versions of what comes after that. One of them um, is uh, maybe exemplified by this book by Ray Kurzweil called The Singularity is Near. And the um, subtitle is a key, When Humans Transcend Biology. So he tells a story in which when the singularity happens, we will have unimaginably good technology that will allow us to, uh, to transcend the biological limits under which we live. Things like the, uh, the, uh, the, the limitations of our physical bodies and uh, perhaps even death itself. We could upload our full persons into a computer. It can live forever. Now, of course, when people start talking about ultra-intelligent, all-knowing beings that cause us to transcend death, it starts to sound like a religious, um, like a religious belief. And indeed, uh, many people have made that argument with respect to this kind of singularity view. And in fact, a few people have even taken it literally. There is a kind of church of AI which, in a very earnest way, uh, claims that uh, this is where we're headed. But that's not my topic today. The other vision for what comes after a singularity is a lot more sobering, and um, it's probably uh, most prominently expressed in this book by Nick Bostrom, a uh, philosopher from Oxford. Um, and here again, the um, subtitle is a key, Superintelligence, Paths, Dangers, and Strategies. So there are paths to superintelligence, they lead to dangers, and we'd better have some strategies. Because what he is talking about is a very, uh, is a very challenging situation. Um, what, what he describes is a superintelligence, which is not only superintelligent in an analytical sense, but also has a superhuman level of emotional and political intelligence. It is able to understand and manipulate people's <laughs> motivations. It is able to manipulate groups of people and institutions in a way that is beyond the powers of any human who's ever lived. And if we have a thing which is much more intelligent than us, that is, it has an uh, unprecedented ability to manipulate ourselves and our institutions, and it doesn't share our values, we are in big trouble. Okay, so 
Superintelligence leads to intelligence explosion, to singularity, and then one of these two things happens. Um, and you know, that branch at the bottom seems kind of important. Uh, people disagree about to what extent we can actually steer versus being either, um, uh, either blessed or doomed to live with one of those. Um, but I want to focus a little bit earlier in the chain um, and talk about whether we think this singularity step is something that's actually going to happen. Because if the singularity is not going to unfold the way that Good and Vinji and others have talked about it, then maybe we need to worry about these a little less or at least think about them differently. So let's assess the singularity, or in other words, should we believe all of that? Okay, so here again is Good's intelligence explosion argument. To get to the singularity, we need this argument to go through. That is, these steps have to all be true. And I wanna focus in particular on the step from number two to number three. Um, whether the uh, assumption that each ultra-intelligent machine will design a machine of even greater intelligence uh, necessarily leads to an intelligence explosion. So we look again at Good's text. Here's what he says. An ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines. There would then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion. Um, look at this word, unquestionably. Um, so those of you who have read a lot of, uh, of documents that intend to persuade have probably learned the trick that the weak point in the argument is usually where the author says clearly or obviously, or in this case, unquestionably. Why? Because if something really is self-evident, it doesn't need that kind of word. I would not say, if I let go of this, it will unquestionably fall. I would simply say it will fall, right? So unquestionably, clearly, obviously means there's some little gap in the argument, and the author is not filling it with argument. They're just filling it with this word. So in fact, this is where I'm gonna focus because I think it is the weak point uh, in Good's argument. All right, so uh, will number two lead to number three? In order to answer that question, we actually need to unpack this term intelligence explosion because it's doing a lot of work in this argument. So what is the intelligence explosion? Fundamentally, the intelligence explosion has to be an argument about the growth rate of machine intelligence, that machine intelligence will grow in a certain way. Um, and actually, there may be three different versions of the argument, three different things that intelligence explosion might mean. Uh, it might mean that growth continues forever in the sense that there is an infinite or at least very long chain of machines, each more intelligent than the one before. Or maybe it means that the growth is exponential uh, over time, lots of things grow exponentially, or maybe it means that the growth is faster than exponential. So to evaluate this, I want to look at each of these three, and for each one we'll ask whether two things are true. First of all, is this version plausibly true? And second, if it were true, would it imply an intelligence explosion? Would it imply an explosion in intelligence? All right, let's look at the first one, that growth continues forever. Does that imply an intelligence explosion? Well, no. Um, here, for example, is a mathematical curve, the hyperbolic tangent. This curve keeps going up. The farther you go to the right, the higher it goes. The slope is always positive. Each step you take to the right, is, you're always a little higher than you were before. And yet, uh, it doesn't go off to infinity. In fact, it gets closer and closer, but never quite reaches this asymptote at y equals 1. So just continuing to grow and always being higher than you were before doesn't necessarily lead to an explosion, and in fact, it doesn't necessarily e lead to growth beyond a certain limit point. So that first version of intelligence explosion, each one higher than the one before, which by the way is literally what Good said, that doesn't imply an explosion at all. What about the second version, that growth is exponential? Does that, is that plausible, and does that imply an explosion? Well, let's look a little bit about what exponential growth is, because people often um, misuse the term. Exponential growth literally means that the increase in a thing is proportional to how much of the thing already existed. So for example, if I have a savings account that pays 1% annual interest, um, that is an exponential growth. Why? Because the amount of interest I get is proportional to its 1% of the amount of money I had in the account at the beginning of the year. So that tells you right away that exponential growth does not imply an explosion because my 1% interest savings account is not leading to a wealth explosion that makes me unimaginably rich. 
So the growth in something is generally is exponential if it's naturally expressed as a growth rate in percent or as a doubling time. So for example, the gross domestic product. When we talk about the GDP of a country, we talk about it in terms of percent growth with reference to the previous year. So we expect that our economy, national economies, grow exponentially. Again, we have not experienced a prosperity explosion, although we're doing pretty well. So exponential growth, um, in this sense, is very common in the natural and social sciences. In some respects, it is the thing that you naturally expect to happen for a lot of phenomena. But exponential growth that's very rapid and sustained over time is actually quite a rare thing. The best example we have of very rapid, sustained exponential growth is Moore's Law. And this is the rule of thumb that the amount of computing capacity you can buy for a dollar cost grows about 60% per year or doubles every 18 months. Uh, this is held true for more than 50 years, about 10 billion times increase in computing power, which is a really amazing thing. Uh, it's a remarkable and incredibly rare example of very fast exponential growth sustained over a very long period of time. In fact, it's the only example I can think of that comes anywhere close in terms of growth rate and sustained growth. It's a very rare thing. So, could exponential growth be the intelligence explosion? Well, exponential growth could be very fast and sustained over time, but that's a thing that's quite rare um, in the natural or human world. Uh, and so, um, we should at least be skeptical of it. All right, so does this mean that growth is faster than, does the intelligence explosion mean growth faster than exponential? Well, what's the best example from the natural or social sciences of something that grows super exponentially? The answer is there isn't one. This is something that basically never happens in the real world. Uh, you can draw it up on a whiteboard. It's a useful theoretical construct, but it almost never happens in real life. Uh, and so I think we can rule it out. There is not a plausible theory as to why intelligence might grow super exponentially. That is not just grow at a very fast exponential rate, but faster than any exponential. There's no reason to think that would happen. Okay, so what, are we, what we're left with is the middle theory, exponential growth, which, um, but even so, there's a bunch more evidence that would be needed to show that it leads to an explosion. But there's another way we can look at this, which is to ask how has machine intelligence been growing so far? And does that look like a fast exponential growth? Well, I want to show you two examples of the growth of machine intelligence over time. One is for chess. People have been trying to get machines to play chess for a long time. Turing actually wrote about it in his 1950 paper. But here's a graph over time of the improvement in machine chess playing skill. So on the x-axis here we have time from 1985 up until roughly the present. And on the y-axis we have ELO rating, which is the natural measure of a chess playing skill. ELO rating is defined so that if two players who are 100 rating points apart play a match, the one with the higher rating will, will, will win about two-thirds of the points. Uh, and what we see over time here is a remarkably linear growth in ELO rating as a function of time, sustained over about 30 years. Um, and this happened during a time when Moore's Law was increasing the available computational resources for playing chess exponentially, and where chess playing algorithms were being improved rapidly by researchers in a manner that is also fairly characterized as exponential. So exponential increases in the inputs to chess playing computing, but linear increase in the actual performance on intelligent task. So maybe exponential growth in inputs doesn't lead, in fact, to rapid growth in, in the result. Here's another example, image recognition. This is a task like looking at an image like this and recognizing that there's a bird there and it's a, ca and it's a cactus wren. So there's lots of different benchmarks for um, image recognition. Here is a very common one called ImageNet. Um, and this shows the best um, machine performance um, over time, uh, measured in error rate. This goes from about 2011 up till the present. The red dotted line, as in the previous graph, is the best human performance. So machines are considerably better than the best people now. Um, and this goes down in a pretty, uh, pretty smooth way. Okay, well this is not exponential growth. Obviously it's, it's going down for one thing. But of course, uh, we're measuring error rate and down is good. We could maybe flip this over. Um, now we turn this graph upside down. What we have is the negative of error rate, that is cor uh, percent correct with 100% correct up at the top. 
And now we see an improvement that goes like this. It goes up, it surpasses the best human performance, which is about 95% correct, and goes up to about 98% now. Is this exponential growth? Well, no, um, it's not. Um, it keeps growing, but there's an inherent limit it can never pass. So remember that graph from before, the hyperbolic tangent? Looks like that. Uh, if we take this hyperbolic tangent curve, we can sort of stretch it and fit it on top of that, um, of that image recognition graph, and what you see is this. It's actually a pretty good fit. And in fact, there's a pretty good theoretical reason why you would expect the uh, performance on this kind of task that is characterized by percent correct to grow according to exactly a hyperbolic tangent curve. So this is pretty much what we would expect to see on a task like this, and it doesn't look like exponential growth. Now you might object that, well, performance on this task is not the metric. The metric ought to be some type, something like uh, an economic utility from doing this task. But if you, if you define utility in terms of a certain utility x for a correct answer and some other utility y, which is probably negative, for an incorrect answer and ask what is the average utility per application, guess what? You have the same shaped curve. Your utility is going to um, level off like this. Once you get past people, there's not that much improvement to be had on this task. So whatever is going on here, and whatever would happen in other tasks characterized by a percent correct measure, it doesn't look like exponential growth. So what we can conclude from all of this um, is that even in a time of rapid improvement in AI, even when AI is surpassing humans on many tasks, the evidence for exponential growth, in fact, in the intelligence of machines is far from clear. And remember that even exponential growth is not by itself sufficient to give you uh, an intelligence explosion. Remember my 1% uh, savings account. So is there going to be an intelligence explosion? Well, I don't think the evidence for it is actually very strong, but we can't say for sure. But one thing that's clear is that those who claim that there will be an explosion have a heavy burden of proof. Uh, because Occam's razor tells us that those who claim that the nature of human existence is going to change dramatically and soon um, have a pretty high burden of proof. Um, and I think that, that burden of proof has not been nearly met um, in the case of the singularity. So, if we don't believe in the singularity, what, do, what should we believe instead? Um, I want to take a different approach to thinking about what the future of AI might look like. And I want to start by asking, what have we learned about the nature of AI as it has developed and as it has developed superhuman capabilities in some areas? And I want to point to three big lessons that we've learned about how AI has developed so far. And then we'll extrapolate from those. Lesson number one is that AI seems not to be a single thing. Instead, it's different solutions for different tasks. AI is, as a technical matter, it's a variety of technical methods. And what seems to work best is to use that toolbox of AI methods in a problem-specific, application-specific way to craft an application-specific solution. This is often discussed in terms of a, a distinction between narrow AI and general AI. Narrow AI is where you focus on solving a particular cognitive task or problem, and you develop task-specific solutions. In narrow AI, we've seen steady progress over the years and growing excitement. All of the examples of AI that you read about in the papers, those are narrow AI. General AI, on the other hand, is, would be a machine intelligence that's usable for any cognitive task. It's a general adaptive intelligence of the type that people have. And there's been, to be frank, not much progress in getting toward, in building an actual general AI. We've advanced theoretical understanding We've built some groundwork, maybe, for understanding human intelligence well enough to understand how we might implement something like it in a machine. There's been some excitement, a little bit of hysteria, but fundamentally, we don't seem to be close to general AI, nor is there a clearly uh, delineated path to getting there. So um, uh, as, uh, as is sometimes said, narrow AI is what you want to learn if you want to make money. General AI makes better movies. So AI is not a single thing. It's different solutions for different tasks. And there's a couple of corollaries of that. First, that AI will surpass human performance at different times for different tasks. There will not be one moment at which AI goes from not as smart as us to smarter than us. Uh, there will perhaps be a moment on any particular task, but there are a great many different cognitive tasks with di where the answer might be different. And it might be difficult to predict when a particular task will become automatable. 
That's lesson number one. Lesson number two from the history of AI is that successful AI doesn't think like a human. If it's an intelligence, it's an alien intelligence. And this means several things. It means, first of all, that attempts to get to machine intelligence by trying to emulate human intelligence have not worked out as well as attempts to simply make good performance on task by using the things that machines excel at. Um, it also means, though, that the style or approach that AI systems tend to use just looks different. And to illustrate this, I want to show you some mistakes that AI systems have made. So on the left here is a, um, this is a, a, an image recognition algorithm that is state of the art. It classified this image as being an Indian elephant. Um, a similar uh, algorithm classified this as being an assault rifle. Uh, and over here, a state of the art facial recognition algorithm identified this person as Mila Jovovich, the famous actress. And if you don't remember what she looks like, she looks like this. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't see the resemblance that much. Um, so you can see that AI make different types of mistakes. And what's happening over here is especially interesting. You might notice this guy is wearing these weird camouflage glasses. Well, as far as the facial recognition algorithm is concerned, those, algor those glasses make him look just like this woman down here. So obviously, the facial recognition algorithm is looking for something very different than what we look for in recognizing faces. So we can laugh at the machines and these silly mistakes they make. Uh, but if they were capable of laughter, they would laugh at the silly mistakes we make, getting wrong cases that are very easy for them. So machine mistakes and human mistakes are just very different. And it's indicative of differences in how machines versus people think. So AI errors won't be like human errors. Advanced AI, on doing a task where there are different styles of doing the task, things related to writing or playing games where there's different styles, like playing poker or something, uh, advanced AI tends to play it in, with a different style than humans. And, and people are a little put off. This thing is super effective at the task, but it doesn't seem to go about it the way that we would. So uh, another implication of this is that what is easy for AI might be difficult for us, and what's e easy for us might be difficult for it. Uh, and that means that effective teaming up between an AI and a person might be very valuable because the strengths, in, because the strengths of one might compensate for the weaknesses of the other. But at the same time, it's really hard to team up with an alien. It's really hard for us to be a good teammate to give the AI what it needs and anticipate what it might do and similarly, it might be very difficult for it to be a good teammate to us. That's the second lesson. And the third lesson from the recent history of AI is that on many cognitive tasks, more engineering effort or more data leads to better performance. That it's possible to invest effort, it's possible to invest money, it's possible to build data sets and just do better through effort. AI doesn't improve on its own, but in any particular area, we can't, it seems like we can accelerate progress by putting in effort or money. So here's an example over time with chess. This didn't happen automatically. It reflected a community of people working very hard over the years in order to get from down here up to a superhuman level, which as far as we know is actually pretty close to perfect play in chess. Similarly, if you look at the famous examples from um, the Google DeepMind team of their system that played the, the game Go, uh, which were much heralded recently, um, that team published a paper in Nature describing their work, and that paper had 15 authors, uh, reflecting dozens of person years of effort. Uh, steady progress by effort, and not automatically. So that means, for example, that machines are, tend to be worse than humans from learning, at experience, at learning from experience, but a machine with a lot of data has a lot more experience to learn from. And so the fact that AI might not be as inherently quick to learn or pick up a task um, or as inherently good at it, can be overcome by effort or investment. All right, so let's take these three lessons and let's extrapolate to a future. The first thing that's pretty clear from uh, this history is that AI intelligence is multidimensional. And it's very uneven. That AI systems might be extremely good at some things and terrible at others. And that that will probably continue to be the case. Even as AI gets progressively better at each thing, there will be huge gaps between its performance relative to us on one task and another. I believe that AIs will eventually surpass us on almost every cognitive task, but not because there is a single system that's better than us at everything, 
but because at any particular task, there is some AI system that beats us at that thing and probably has no clue at all how to do anything else. That's a very different kind of superintelligence. One that is multifaceted, consists of lots of different units. Uh, and so that's why in talking about this, um, I think it's useful to talk about not a singularity, but a multiplicity. That you'll have all these different systems which, um, which are good at one particular thing, in some cases better than us. So this multiplicity version is a little bit different than the singularity. Um, and I want to talk about what, um, what its characteristics are. First of all, the mul this multiplicity is an era and not a moment. It's something that unfolds over time as AI catches up with us and passes us on different tasks. It's a gradual transition rather than an explosion, something that develops over the course of decades. I think it's a time for us to make decisions about how to adapt. It's not a preordained future that's going to happen to us because it happens over time and because these AI systems develop because of choices about investment and effort. We have some ability to determine the shape of the future intelligence and, and on what tasks and in what ways these systems will acquire superhuman capabilities. And then finally, um, mo and most importantly, this is a transition that's happening already. Computers are already better than us at a number of important cognitive tasks and that number is only going to grow over time. So this is not something we're talking about in the future. This is an era we're living at. In. We're living in the early phases of it, but it's already started. All right, so what does all of this mean for policy? If you're trying to build policy around the idea of a singularity, uh, what you end up facing is a set of challenges that look kind of like this. Uh, we're going along smoothly, and then all of a sudden, bam, there's super intelligence, and we sort of fall off the waterfall, uh, and we're in deep, deep trouble. But the multiplicity view, the view of a transition that develops more gradually, is a bit more like this. It's a bit more like whitewater rapids. Starts out not too difficult, maybe with calm water, but it grows more challenging over time. Um, and as we go through it, if we lose our paddles or our helmets or maybe even a person or two overboard, we're going to have to deal with what's left with the tools we have remaining. And so it's a set of challenges that we need to uh, be up to and not make mistakes even early on. So I think that all of the problems the singularity people talk about are real problems. But they're not so much extreme problems that will hit us suddenly 25 years from now. They're problems that are already developing. So let's compare what the singularity people are worried about with what I think we should worry about. Singularity theorists worry that AI will kill us all. We should worry about the safety of automated systems. We're building increasingly complex automated AI-based systems that are going to control things like our vehicles, already controlling our airplanes and air traffic control, our power grid, and many other critical infrastructures. Um, and we need to take seriously the idea that as we automate these systems, there's increased risk and risk that we may not understand as well. Singularity theorists worry that AI will take all the jobs. We should worry instead about a time of transition in which the nature of the demands that the job market puts on workers are changing rapidly. The skills that are needed are changing rapidly. And there's more churn in the job market. More jobs disappearing, more new jobs being created, and a greater need for rapid adaptation by workers. And we need to think about how to prepare workers for this and how to protect workers from the turbulence that is going to happen as we go through these rapids. Singularity theorists worry that AI will enslave us. We need to worry about how to maintain fairness and social justice in an environment where decisions are increasingly being made in an automated way. How can we make sure that we are not baking in past bias um, or the injustices that are built into our current structure? How can we make sure that that doesn't happen? How can we make sure that the development of this technology doesn't lead to an economic and social stratification that's more extreme than we have now? How do we maintain fairness? That's the real thing we should be worrying about. Uh, and singularity theorists worry that AI will outsmart us. I'm much more concerned that we will outsmart ourselves in this transition. Now, in thinking about how to deal with this, um, I keep coming back to the legend of Milo of Croton. So Milo was a legendary strongman in ancient Greece. And according to legend, he started to lift a baby calf every day. As the calf grew and got heavier, he kept lifting it. And his strength grew as the weight of this cow grew. 
uh, until eventually he could lift a full-grown bull. So that's what we have to do. We have to use the problems that AI is already posing for us uh, today to learn and practice our responses because we're going to face much more serious and heavier versions of these same challenges as time goes on. And we need to build up our capabilities and we need to learn about these problems while we still can. Because if Milo had waited until the, until the cow was half grown, he would not have been able to lift it. He couldn't even get started on this exercise program. And if we don't get started on these problems now or pretty soon, we're in danger of falling behind and really losing control over what's happening. The good news is that this multiplicity will be gradual, like the growth of, growth of Milo's calf. But the challenge for us is that we need to start lifting it now. And as we know, our societies are not always good at dealing with challenges that are very important but come on gradually. Think of climate change, for example. Nonetheless, this is what we have to do in this situation. So my message to you, with apologies to Ray Kurzweil, who titled his book, The Singularity is Near, is not to worry too much about a singularity. Instead, to look around us and realize that the multiplicity is here, and it's time to start dealing with it. Thanks. <laughs> uh, one thing that kind of was unsatisfying about your argument, I think, was when you were looking at, say, the, the history of chess yes. improvement and saying it's not exponential, the singularity argument doesn't apply there, right? The singularity of argument is that the machines are building better machines, yes. and that wasn't what was going on. Yeah. That a, a machine that's good at general things, including building other general AI machines. And we don't have one of those yet. So right. I don't think we can look at the past history of anything and say, well, that wasn't exponential growth in AI because we haven't really gotten to step one yet. And I think that what the, the singularist, what word? Sure. Let's, let's use that word. Yeah, so let me talk a little bit more about this. It's an excellent point. Um, um, and I think a version of the talk for a computer science audience, which you obviously are, um, uh, is uh, would talk more about the role of machines in designing machines. The machines that we use nowadays are mostly designed by machines already. Um, and so again, you know, this sort of pure, um, Jack Good version of the argument in which people design machines and then, and then machines get better at that and they elbow us aside and take over um, is not really what has been happening. What's been happening is that uh, tasks associated with the design of machines um, have been more and more automated, allowing human engineers to design more and more complex, higher level and more efficient systems, right? Um, and so I think we will I think with respect to design of machines, what we will see is a gradual transition where machines take on more and more of the task of designing machines while people do the rest. Um, and I guess I'd say that. The other thing I would say is that there is a much, there is a much more careful but longer unpacking of the, um, uh, of, um, the point that you made uh, in a paper by David Chalmers, which is I think really interesting that asks, what would have to be true in order for an intelligence explosion to occur? Um, and um, the argument gets a little bit complicated and, and technical, but um, bottom line is um, I don't think it's clear that conditions would change that much if we had either a general intelligence or just a machine that's better at the narrow intelligence task, narrow AI task of designing machines. Um, I think we're actually some distance down the road to having machines 
that are pretty good at the narrow AI task of designing machines. Um, and I think that machine design will be done at a super intelligent level by a narrow AI system before general AI exists. And so if there is a takeoff of intelligence explosion style, it would happen at that point. But I'm, um, so I think we would still be in a, um, in a narrow AI world. Thank you. <laughs> My question is a very simple one. It's something that, that bothered me from the first time, first year of law school. And it's still having, it's getting worse, I think. It's a major, major issue of freedom and the system is trying to come down with the Yeah. All of a sudden, my little machine that I have now is difficult to get all my machines. I'm dabbling my privacy with it. I have absolutely no way at this moment of protecting myself against Sure. So, right. So the question is about privacy. And of course, and when I talked about those three big trends that are driving AI, more data, what is that data about? It's about, it's about us, right? Bigger, uh, more effective algorithms for extracting knowledge from that data, knowledge about us, and bigger, faster computers for storing that and doing those algorithms. So that is precisely the privacy challenge, that technology is creating much more data, of, enabling the creation of much more data about us and much more inference of, in, of things about us from that data. Um, and so the stakes in the privacy policy discussion um, are only going up. Um, and what we have not seen in most places is substantial changes in the policy around privacy. Uh, it's a, it is a very serious issue. I don't think um, really any policy process anywhere has dealt in a really comprehensive way with that challenge. Um, so you're right to be concerned about that um, because uh, the stakes are going up and the policy tools don't seem to be getting better. Oh, thank you. put a whole lot of data together, the amount of curious patterns that you're going to find is going to be, let's not use the word exponential, yeah. but it's going to skyrocket. And our capacity, especially when we talk about human behavior, to detect what is relevant is not as big as some people think. So I believe that the core principle of data protection in your Purpose limitation, when you look even at the definition of machine learning, people like Mitchell, so you first have to think of the task of using this narrow AI that is aligned very <coughs> well with this uh, purpose limitation. <coughs> and I think that even AI now is more bothered by data obesity, too much data, and it's more expensive to figure out which data and data, a pattern of data types, which is the consequence. So I think, maybe a bit optimistic, that things like the GDPR are going to save us from bad AI. So I'm very curious. What I think about that. Um, so it certainly is a practical problem in applying AI that comes up a lot, um, uh, you know, uh, of a false precision that comes from, if you will, shrink wrapping a solution around idiosyncratic data. 
Um, and um, uh, the term that machine learning people use for that is overfitting. Um, and the, there are methods that, that are, have been developed and are being developed that are designed to resist that and, that, and to do privacy, more privacy friendly versions of machine learning. So there, you have a set of data about a large number of individuals and based on that, you train a model which is able to do, let's say, some prediction task about individuals. And you can arrange things so that that model does not encode uh, much information about any individual person in the original data set. But then you take that model, which, does, which is by itself um, privacy friendly or privacy preserving, and you apply it to the data of an individual and then you treat them differentially based on that prediction. Um, and so parts of the training process of AI can be done in a way that is more friendly to privacy and better resists those sorts of problems. But then when you go to apply the result to, to individuals and make decisions that are consequential for those individuals, um, you will see uh, effects that uh, relate to privacy and the privacy related harms. And I think there's no getting around that. Any algorithm or system which is making predictions about people and making decisions based on those predictions will necessarily get the predictions wrong and therefore the decisions um, harmful for some people. Um, and that those harms may tend to fall differentially on certain, certain groups or people. Um, and that's certainly an area for concern and one that AI experts are starting to pay a lot of attention to. Um, and how well they will do at addressing those problems in the long run, I think, remains to be seen. So my question is, um, how do you prepare groups? Who might have been in the camp of, I have nothing to hide, and this is yeah. the information we want to figure out our own privacy? Yes. Or who are in the camp of, we do need to work straight from this, you know, no issue with that. How do we prepare them for the, you know, clear, clear engineering point to this problem? Sure. Um, I mean, this is partly a hard problem because the nothing to hide argument has not been on the merits a very good argument for a long time, right? Um, that everybody does have something to hide in the sense that um, we all do things every day that we don't want the public watching us do, for example. Um, and um, And a lot of social interaction relies on a certain discretion, right? Um, that, for example, that not all the people around us know exactly what we think of them at every moment. Um, so the idea of limiting information flow is something that is sort of so built into our interactions that we can almost forget that it's happening. Um, I think that sometimes people don't fully appreciate the privacy implications of what is happening um, because they don't ha aren't fully informed about what is happening. Um, some everyday practices that people in technology industry think of as, um, as normal, oh, everybody knows that happens, um, in fact, are not that well known to the public. Uh, the other thing that I think it is hard about this is the collective effects, where you might have some information which about an individual, which on the individual basis doesn't, uh, isn't so uh, troublesome, but when you aggregate it over a large number of people, there's a collective harm that can result. Um, and that's a situation where focusing on the individual is really not the right, uh, is not going to get you there, because the individual may in fact not have that much at stake in their own data. Um, and you need a way of thinking which is more, uh, more ecological in nature. Um, to deal with those sorts, of, those sorts of situations. And the theory and practice of making that argument also is not, I think, not very well developed, has not been made very successfully.
What do you think about the prospect? Are we able to have any of those or just uh, can, like can we develop an AI that has will or imagination? It, right. it seems like to have the kind of will or imagination that's similar to a person, you might need to reach general AI um, as a precondition for that. Um, and then I think you know we should ask whether we want a super intelligent agent to have will. Um, there is um, an agent that wants something that is much more intelligent than us and wants something other than um, good for us um, is, is, is a very dangerous uh, agent. I think there are some bad arguments that are made about the danger of an AI that is, um, that is trying too hard to achieve some goal. Um, but I do think it's a really interesting question of whether, first of all, whether something like will or imagination is necessary for something that we would recognize as will or imagination is necessary for uh, intelligent action. Um, I think our thinking about the nature of intelligence is very limited by the fact that we have only one example to look at. Um, and it's not clear how, whether it's possible to have a different kind of intelligence that lacks some of those attributes and to what extent our intelligence is intertwined with our, um, our emotion and our will. Um, you know, we got the way we are by an evolution process which caused us to want power and to have certain desires and urges that are not always healthy. Um, something that is designed to be intelligent but not to have will, um, I, I, it's not clear whether that can exist and um, whether we would want it to. I think there's just a lot of unanswered questions here. Yes. Sure. Um, well, so a lot of examples, I think. Let me point to a couple, which maybe point in different directions. Um, one place we can look is to systems that um, bring AI-based prediction into, uh, into systems of government. And probably the place where this is most salient is in criminal justice. Um, in um, technologies like predictive policing or the use of uh, risk prediction tools in sentencing and decisions about parole and bail and so on. Um, and there's been a lot of controversy about this. Um, on the one hand, there are very real concerns about bias um, and about unintended consequences from doing this. Uh, on the other hand, I think there's actually pretty good social science evidence that it's possible in principle to do better at making these decisions. That, for example, decisions about uh, which um, accused uh, defendants uh, should be let out on bail and which should be held might be made in a way which is both um, more effectively protects the public from those who are really dangerous and also imposes pretrial incarceration on fewer defendants. Um, there's pretty strong evidence based on AI driven data analysis that that ought to be possible. So um, being able to navigate this situation in a way that is level-headed in the sense that we don't put too much faith in a system because it's automated and we ask the hard questions and demand evidence of efficacy and fairness on the one hand, but also that we don't shy away from a technology that really can do better. Um, I think that's a very difficult thing to do. And one of the ways in which we may hurt ourselves is to be too slow and shy about bringing um, 
about bringing AI technologies into uh, deployment when they really are helpful. Another, the second example I was going to go to there has to do with self-driving vehicles, uh, where concerns about safety scenarios and, for example, there's a debate about trolley problems and, you know, how will these, um, how will these systems deal with a situation where it can veer left and injure its occupants or veer right and injure three, three school children. You can make up all the hypotheticals and people often sort of put these hypotheticals out as a way of saying, well, we need to have answers implemented in the technology before we should deploy it. But there's another kind of trolley problem that we face as well, which is the problem of do we hold back on a technology that is demonstrably safer because of these concerns? Um, that is, even if a self-driving vehicle gets a trolley problem wrong, it may still on balance be much safer. Um, and I worry that we may worry about cases that aren't very common, or we may demand a level of evidence for safety that's too high. And in so doing, we'll hold back a, a technology that would save a lot of lives. Uh, because huge numbers of people, millions of people a year worldwide are killed in, um, in highway accidents. And that number can be substantially reduced once we get to a world with mature and widely deployed self-driving vehicle technology. It would be a shame if we hold that back too much because we're concerned about problems that are um, of intellectual interest but, um, uh, but, but don't um, do much to affect the interests of those people who are at risk. So, that's a way, so we can outsmart ourselves by racing ahead too quickly and locking ourselves into bad technologies, but also by holding back on things that we should be doing. Let me answer that in two ways. One way is, I mean a fairly broad definition of cognitive task, um, that, that, and that in fact almost any decision process which is based on observation and thinking, where thinking includes the empathetic imagination, um, I would put within, I would classify that as a cognitive task. It might be difficult for an automated system to do. Um, but often the way these systems are turned into precise cognitive tasks is to say that we're going to ask the system to try to predict uh, what, um, what a trained person would do or what the consensus of a group of trained people would be. Um, and uh, arguably if a system is extremely accurate in predicting what a consensus of experienced and trained people would do on a particular task, um, that looks a lot like success. Um, and given that we are taking, as uh, AI researchers almost always do, the view that we're looking for a system that behaves as if intelligent uh, and not asking how it gets there, um, I think it's possible to demonstrate for some of these tasks that um, you can, in fact, um, that, that a system can, in fact, perform well. Um, Many of the tasks that systems have been asked to do already are ones that we think of as involving some judgment in some sense. Uh, things like language translation, for example, um, often involve judgment, um, often involve judgments and context-dependent judgment about how to describe something. Um, what is the right way to translate a particular word or phrase um, often depends on a really subtle understanding of the situation that's being described. Um, if what's being described is an interaction among people, there's a lot of context that often goes into the kind of 
um, the, the, uh, the precise result that comes out of translation. And that's one of the things that a great human translator does, right? They understand the context and use a word that has a connotation or mood to it that matches what's going on. Um, and machines have been able to do those tasks at some level. Um, what, I think one of the surprises of experience with AI so far is that things that we think of as requiring emotion or judgment um, don't seem to be walled off or impossible for AI systems. They seem to be difficult, but, off, but, but it seems to be possible to make progress on them. So I would not draw a line around certain types of decision-making processes that humans do and say that AI will never get there. Um, some of them they will get to sooner and some later. Um, but I think one of the lessons of the recent history in this field is that uh, we have often been mistaken in saying that something is fundamentally human and machines will not be able to do it. And so we should be, um, we should be cautious about saying that in general. Sure. Um, I think the best economics evidence is that what we can expect is, is um, some existing jobs to either disappear or be transformed, but um, new jobs to come along. Um, that this has been the case with past industrial revolutions. Um, and it's indeed been the case um, counter to predictions for some of the uh, automation waves that have happened in the past. So for example, um, when um, automated teller machines came along, the prediction was there would be fewer jobs for bank tellers. And that was true in the short run, but in the long run, there are in fact more people working as bank tellers today per capita than were working as bank tellers when ATMs first came on the scene. Somewhat to the surprise, banks have decided to compete by placing, by having more retail branches and by changing to some extent the nature of what a teller does. Um, similarly, um, the, uh, the move to um, online shopping as opposed to in-person retail has shifted employment, but it has not reduced the employment in, um, in, uh, in the general area of servicing um, uh, consumers' retail needs. There are more jobs in logistics, more jobs in transportation, um, and more jobs in developing the technologies and systems that are involved. But those are different jobs. They require different skills. Um, and so this is why I think the concern is more about a mismatch between the skills and experience that workers have versus the jobs that the job market offers than they are about the total number of jobs being insufficient. Um, and that's still a very serious problem um, and that we should not minimize. That that mismatch can be a problem, and of course, there's tons of social science evidence that says that even short periods of unemployment or job insecurity have major negative impacts on people, on workers and their families. Um, and we need to absolutely uh, pay attention to that, and we need to do a better job as a society in helping people cope with these things. Um, but I don't think it's, I don't think that the economic evidence leads us to a conclusion that jobs won't exist. Um, it's more a change. So, um, Salkis and Mollison and Weaver so recently had this tool in which um, technology is emerging very efficiently and becoming more complex, even more quickly than I was wearing sure. the graphics. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee a breaking point at some point, and should we start thinking about redesigning how we govern ourselves? Should, yeah, should we think about redesigning how, our, how we govern ourselves? Um, I think we should always be thinking about that, and <laughs> there is some evidence that. Um, um, that uh, we should be thinking especially hard now, perhaps more on my side of the border. Um, the, um, so yes, um, but I do think it's possible with wise policy making to build policies that are durable across changes in technologies. Um, and one interesting example here has to do with the laws about cars and driving, um, which have been 
surprisingly robust in dealing with the changes around self-driving vehicles. Um, I think had you gotten legal experts who study these things together in a room 10 years ago, they would have said that comprehensive changes would probably be needed in liability and in the insurance markets and the way that laws and regulations around vehicles and driving are structured in order to enable self-driving vehicles to be practically um, deployed. Um, but I think the consensus now on that has shifted that, um, um, that if a self-driving car gets in an accident, that looks like a manu that might look like a manufacturing defect, which is something that the law already knows how to deal with. So notions of product liability um, and uh, how the line is drawn between a uh, responsibility of the driver because of something the human driver or owner of the vehicle did versus something that is built into the vehicle at the factory. That distinction and the legal mechanisms that follow from it seem to be fairly robust in dealing with the challenges around um, uh, ensuring um, that the risks and liabilities around self-driving vehicles are uh, uh, operate reasonably. Um, so that aspect of law and policy has been more robust than expected. Um, we also see examples that are not at all robust. Um, so to me, one of the big challenges and what, um, in this area, and one of the things that involve, involving sophisticated technical understanding in policymaking can achieve is to try to design laws and policies, regulations that um, are more resilient against changes in technology and especially resilient against the changes that are likely to come. Because even if we can't precisely predict the future, I think uh, one thing that we can often do is say that certain kinds of distinction that's, that the law might try to draw sort of don't make deep sense technically and, are, and, and really reflect accidents. So one thing, for example, one example that often comes to mind in the US is distinctions in the Telecommunications Act between information services and computer services. Um, or information services and, and, and communication services, excuse me. Um, and that is a distinction that's just really hard to maintain at a co basic conceptual level. And it should have been obvious when this law was passed in 1996 that this distinction, that, the, that this law tried to make fundamental was not going to stand the test of time and that we were gonna have a complicated and messy policy situation going forward because of it, which in, in fact we have. Um, so I am more hopeful that it's possible to do this well, which doesn't mean we always do. Final question. Um, on your slides you said almost everything can be automated. Yes. What can't be automated? What can't be automated? Well, for one thing, there are things that we don't want to be automated. There are lots of things that we would like to be done by a person. Um, uh, and indeed, one of the ways of thinking about what the role for humans would be in a world where robots are better at everything um, is to ask what are the jobs in which we want the job to be done by a person or where the fact that it's done by a person is part of the product. Um, and these are not, and, and sometimes we think these are jobs that involve, that are sort of caring jobs. Um, and that's certainly one of the areas, but there's lots of other examples where that's not the case. Um, and uh, one interesting example is coffee. That um, when you, Starbucks for example, has a rule that their baristas are not supposed to make more than one coffee at a time. Even though that's more efficient, they want it to be the case that there's a moment where that person is fussing over your coffee. Uh, and in fact, there's plenty of evidence that although machines make more, more tasty coffee more consistently than human baristas, we actually want a human to fuss over our coffee, right? We'll pay extra to have a hipster fuss over our coffee. And in <laughs> fact, we'll go down the street to a different coffee shop to have a better class of hipster uh, fuss over our coffee. Um, I think that's pretty well established because that's part of the product, that there is a person who is paying attention to doing the thing for you. So artisanal anything, often part of what we want is that a person has made it and that it's imperfect in the way that fl follows from that person having done the job. So there's lots of things I think we want people to do. Um, as far as what can be automated, which was your actual question, I'm a little bit less sure. I was maybe just hedging there. 
um, in terms of what might eventually be automated. But I think there are plenty of things that we will not want to have automated or for which attempts to automate them will turn out to be possible but not really viable. Okay. Please join me in thanking. Thank you.